This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Jeff McIntyre, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. Me? Yes. Great to be here, Alex. Thank you. I, I appreciate now, it, let, Can I just say, right, to kick things off, I think I have to state the obvious. Yeah. You know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, I don't think there's any bigger warning sign that the end is near by the fact that Alex booked a failed filmmaker on a show. I mean, come on, if that's not proof <laughs> the end is coming, just start digging your bunker. These are desperate times, my listen, friend. Uh, listen, listen, come my on. friend. Um, I, 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 I hope I'm the host, and I'm a failed filmmaker in many ways as well. So don't don't worry oh. about it. So <laughs> we we have all failed okay. in one way, shape, or form. So it's Thank all you. good. But I also also do believe that you learn much more from failure than you ever do from success. So that's 100%. why hundred percent. And that's why um, you and I, which are, I'm assuming, similar vintages as far as age is concerned, uh, that we, um, <laughs> we, we uh, old enough, old enough, sir. Exactly. We have the shrapnel, uh, and uh, and uh, you, what is it? What's that saying? My my wife says it all the time. The devil is more devil because of how long he's been around, or how old he is. So it's not because he's a devil. Oh, yeah. He's had more practice. He's right. More practice to, uh, <laughs> to perfect his devilish antics. Exactly. But yes, we have the shrapnel, but we've also got the medicine to help <laughs> soothe the wounds of for, the for people rocky listening, road that he, is in the film. I think he's holding up a uh, wild turkey. Is that? <laughs> no, it's, it, this is High whiskey. West. High this West. Great uh, stuff from Utah. Oh, look it, at that whiskey. If you like good bourbons and whiskeys, they are just knocking it out of the park. There you go. There you go. But I know I could see you possibly don't believe me and you need a little proof. So what I'll do for the community, <laughs> I'm taking one for the community. Here. Mm. I feel. And this guarantees this show is only going to get better. I, I, I feel that this is going to be a good episode, Jeff. I am just have a feeling that this might be a fun episode. So first and foremost, yeah. Jeff, how did you get into this ridiculous business? <laughs> that is the key word. Um, I'll take you way back to the, the ripe young age of 15. I got started in radio at this cheese ball local radio what, station. What is, what is this? What is this? Radio, what is this radio you speak of? I don't understand. Oh, uh, I, I'm is not it like a podcast? <laughs> no, no, no. This was a real uh, FM radio station back <laughs> in 1985. Uh, <laughs> it was a true cast. Yes. Not yeah. a podcast. Right, right. And uh, they eventually acquired even a cheesier uh, cable access station. So, that's kind of where the ball started rolling. About 16, 17, started doing on-camera stuff. But the real pivotal moment where things really uh, broke open, and I really owe a lot of my career to, was AFI. Mm -hmm. um, not not the, the film school. Uh, alternative fact interpretation. AFI. Uh, I told a couple really big lies to score some really sweet positions uh, with ABC TV. Mm -hmm. This is back in the 90s, and they... In a de desperate spot. They needed technicians. They needed shooters, editors, and the bar was so low. Anyone with a pulse and one working good eye probably could have gotten a gig. So I come in. I meet with the head honcho, this gruff, old, grizzled news guy. Yeah, well, who are you? What do you? What can you do for me? Well, uh, I, I, I'm an editor. Sure, sure, I am. Why not? I could be anything the guy wanted that day. And granted, to that point, I had edited um, very prestigious productions like weddings and bar mitzvahs. Uh, so I, I understood the basics of cutting, but maybe not on the broadcast news level. But the interview's progressing. Uh, can you edit? Sure, I can edit. You can do news? Well, it would be news to me if I couldn't do news, sir. Wow. Um, wow. Oh, this sounds good. So you'll start tomorrow. I said, oh, just out of curiosity, for, for your news business here, what kind of um, uh, equipment do you use to edit your news? Oh, the Sony Arm 450. Oh, of course. Great choice. That's what I'd use. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. So I get in the parking lot and I break out my big, huge cell phone. And I call a buddy who owns a production company. Okay, great. It's Jeff. I just got this sweet gig at Channel 7, but I have to learn how to edit. Do you have a Sony RM350? And he said, come on over. He got me up to speed. And that's what really started the professional ball rolling. And from there, I told some other sweet lies saying, sure, I know how to shoot professional stuff and produce in the field. So they send me to foreign countries. And oh, yeah. that's what I tell uh, young filmmakers and professionals. Don't wait till the door opens for you. The moment you see a crack, you bust through that door mm -hmm. and uh, show up with confidence. Mm -hmm. 
And if you know in your heart you're not going to screw people over and you probably can learn on the job and do so quickly, um, you do it because those opportunities rarely come twice. And that's it. Yep. Those moments. And that is exactly what I did with my fake uh, editing demo reel, which I used by grabbing other people's commercial spots, raw footage, re-editing them, slapping a Nike logo at the end of it. And I would go and oh they were like, you know, 20, like 10 million, five million dollar commercials, whatever. Like, but they were foreign right. raw footage from like Europe. And I was editing. I was working at a production house. I grabbed it all, put it together, send it out. And I started working as an editor really quickly. <laughs> But you knew you had the skills. You Correct. You not had the opportunity Fake it yet. till you make it. You mm -hmm. back the claims. Correct. That's and the that's thing. That's the thing. When you're going to fake it till you make it, you need to understand that you might have to bend the truth to get in the door, but you've mm -hmm. got to produce once you're in the door or learn on the job and things like that. And I did that multiple times while I was coming up. And I think all big, you know, all, all professionals at one point or another extended the truth of what their capabilities or experience was and figure it out along the way just to get the opportunity. Cause you're right. If you see that crack, you got to bust through that door <laughs> without question. Definitely. It's not like today where we all own the transmitter. Basically we Correct. all have our own channels, but back in the days you and I were coming up, I mean, there were huge oh. gatekeepers. Oh yeah. Gun guarded, gun guarded gates. And they weren't letting you and me in. Mm, that's for damn sure, sir. Now, tell me about your new film, The Great Cookie Comeback. Tell me about it. I really prefer not to talk about that film. Um, <laughs> I'd like to talk about some interpretive dance. I, what? Oh, my God. It's gonna oh, my be God. It's gonna be a Fine. Long okay, we'll talk about that film. <laughs> so... I don't know. Too long uh, to admit. About four or five years ago, my producing partner, Jason, he lives in Hawaii, Honolulu, and he crosses paths with this guy named Wally Amos. And um, just by namesake, yeah, Wally Amos, I, I don't know. Uh, I've never heard of him. But then when you learn that he's the Amos behind famous Amos cookies, mm -hmm. which we've all enjoyed at a gas station um, uh, <laughs> near you, <laughs> uh, vending machine. Yeah. Yes. Um, and these actually have the shelf life of gravel, um, the packaged version. So th this is good bunker. Uh, good bunker material, so absolutely. You know. um, but back in the day, so Wally Amos, um, the cool thing about Wally, I'm sorry, the, the, the booze is kicking in. So sure, 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 sure. To focus here. So my, my, my buddy crosses, crosses paths with him, and then uh, the idea is, oh, let's do a reality show with Wally. I'm like, no, no one wants to see a reality show with this 80 plus year old guy. Let's do a documentary. His life is so rich and most people only know him, you know, based on his sweet treats, mm -hmm. but his life before cookies was just uh, jaw droppingly interesting. He was a, a music agent. One of the first black talent agents in the U S worked for William Morris. He discovered People like The Temptations, he signed Diana Ross, Marvin Gaye. He discovered um, uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Jesus. So, the, exactly. So that part of Wally's life is really, really interesting. And so that's how his entree to cookies came to be. He was representing um, an actress, Sherry Summers, who was in Harold and Maude, which is one, mm -hmm. of my, one of my more favorite classic films, uh, very quirky. And as they were finishing up a meeting, Sherry busts out this bag of chocolate chip cookies. And Wally's like, where'd you get these? She's like, oh, I, I made them. I just love to make cookies. So Wally started eating them. And it reminded him of uh, simpler days of his past when his aunt used to make cookies. So he went home uh, that night and just started making cookies. He was so, he fell so in love with the process of baking cookies and giving them away that in Hollywood at that time, that became his trademark. Whenever he'd take a meeting, He'd bring a small bag of his famous chocolate chip cookies. So he kind of he had this reputation around town as the cookie man. So um, one night he's meeting with Quincy Jones, his secretary. They're having dinner on the Sunset Strip. And she says, you know, Wally, you and I should start a cookie store. And he left that meeting. And that idea has stuck in his head ever since, decades later. So in 1975, Wally opened the very first chocolate chip cookie store. And I know by today's standards, there's, there's, there's candy stores, there's cookie stores. Yeah. Back in the day, there wasn't. He took a big risk to try something brand new, and it, it took off. He became a pop culture icon. He was on every TV show. And for 10 years, he kind of ruled the roost in cookies. 
until he didn't and he lost it all. But um, should we go there? Do I need to take? I mean, we, we, I mean, we, 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 if they have to watch the movie. They have to watch the movie. So that's a, I don't want to give it all away. Exactly. Well, I actually uh, when we, we were discussing before we got on air that I actually saw Wally on Shark Tank. He was pitching his new cookies that he was trying to uh, his new cookie company he's trying to launch. Uh, but uh, just to, just just know everyone that watch the movie. But generally speaking, that Wally lost everything, uh, lost his company. Uh, it, it was pretty. It's a pretty brutal story, a pretty brutal entrepreneurial story. And uh, and then this this documentary is about his comeback. I'm assuming, hence the name. Right. And it, it digs into some of the pitfalls along his path. And it's, it's great lessons for anyone in business. Uh, you don't sign contracts without really understanding what you're signing. The big thing that um, kind of crippled him since the 80s and what he's been trying to overcome ever since when um, these companies would take him over, he signed away the rights to use his own God-given name and likeness for any future baked good company. And that's all he does. Cookies. So they prohibited him for using uh, what everyone knows him for. And he started like 12 other cookie companies since Famous Amos. But nowhere along the way was he able to say, hey, you out there, cookie lovers, I'm the guy who started that cookie that you remember and love. That really hurt him. And that's why he didn't get a deal on Shark Tank because um, he has no access to his woman on that show said, yeah, you're just another random cookie on the shelf now. If we can't tell the public um, who you were. So that was really tough. But I think the, 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 the better takeaway from the film, the inspirational lesson is, despite of setback after setback, nothing stops this guy. Mm -hmm. He continues to persevere at 85, and he's trying to start his quote-unquote final, final cookie company. But nothing slows him down, and that's a great lesson for all of us, especially in this space, <laughs> to really hang on to. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You can yeah. never we, filmmakers. We have, like I said, we have a sickness that once you're bitten, you can't get rid of it. Um, and it flares up yeah. and it goes dormant, but it's always there. It's always there now. Um, but you have to be smart in how you manage the symptoms. Except, well, that's good. Work. I like that. I'm going to use that one. I like that one. Hashtag it, baby. And now, um, <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, what was the budget of this documentary? Since I wear all the hats, mainly because I like to cover my bald spot. Mm -hmm. um, I shot it, produced it, sure. uh, edited it. Um, so hard cash, hard costs were roughly 15000 Oh, that's And that that's included very... everything. It's nothing. And yeah, I try to keep my productions low. And that's very uh, smart. I've been yelling that for the top of the mountain for a long time. Keep your overhead as low as humanly possible. So fifteen grand for a, for a documentary with a known... Entity like uh, Famous Amos, which I mean, everybody, right. you just say Famous Amos, everyone goes, oh, the cookie guy. Oh, this is the documentary about the yep. cookie guy. So so you actually have a winning formula here. You've got a known person who's very recognizable around the world just by the name at least. Um, and then you also have very low cost. So this is a perfect, like if you were coming to me and I was consulting you on this, I'd be like, you are a perfect candidate for self-distribution without question. So what made you decide to go down the self-distribution route as opposed to going down the traditional route where you could have easily, I think, gotten a distribution deal off of this and you might have even been able to get some sort of MG because of the topic and because of the star of the documentary. One step back before I try to dodge your question. Um, <laughs> so another great thing that was in our benefit, and I think it's smart as filmmakers to really zoom out and survey the entire landscape of what's going on in some of your main subjects' lives. What is their network like? And this was right at the time um, we embarked on this. We knew he was going to be on Shark Tank. Whenever you can leverage mm -hmm. uh, somebody else's free press, I mean, this episode is rerun probably eight, nine times. And if you or I were try to try buy a 10-minute slot on that network, forget it. There's no way we could afford that kind of ad had money. So that was great to put him back on the radar of public consciousness on that show. And that helped in our efforts. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of in the same rocky, leaky boat as other indie filmmakers thinking, well, yeah, let me Google um, film distribution. Let me listen to Alex's show. I know he interviews some distributors now and again. These must be the good guys. So I'll blast them all with emails, links to trailers, get them excited. And I did all that. 
And I was met with, you know, 90% Crickets. of F you, we have no interest, thanks, but no thanks. The one or two who, who bit um, on the chocolate chip, uh, you know, did the standard uh, crappy offer. Mm -hmm. I threw, they threw the flame in the dumpster to see if I wanted to buy the dumpster before the fire really took off. And um, it was at this time I was getting really frustrated. And that's when I stumbled upon uh, your buddy, Rob Hardy, had a course, mm -hmm. uh, Film Audience Blueprint, where it taught you how to go find an audience for your film, uh, identify niches, and then market directly to them. And that course really was an eye-opener because um, at the moment, I knew I couldn't take on Hollywood's marketing machinery. There is no way yeah. I can compete with their ad spends, mm -hmm. match them or outspend them. We will always lose on that front. Mm -hmm. So the, the shotgun approach Hollywood uses to spray out their message to everyone, hoping that everyone is their niche and their audience, can't work for indie filmmakers. So I thought the only way I could survive this is do a laser-targeted niche focus mm -hmm. with my market. Um, find the niches that I think the story resonates with and market direct. And through taking this course, it gave me the confidence to step in on my own after getting a couple crappy offers from distributors. And I just felt that I could do better. Maybe not. Maybe I didn't. The first <laughs> round didn't back that principle, but I still have hope um, that when I do launch 2.0, I'll be a better armed to make a much bigger splash the next time. So how did you, because I'm, because now I'm, I'm kind of breaking this down and analyzing the, the film and how I would approach it. It is a niche film, but it's a fairly large niche. So are we talking about, you know, seniors because he's older? Are we talking about entrepreneurs because of who he is? Yep. Are we talking yep. about cookie enthusiasts? Um, <laughs> like, who are your niches? And did how you did you hack my Excel doc, Alex? <laughs> I mean, how, how did, did you do all that? So how did you, um, first of all, identify those niches? And and the thinking and, and, and those three niches I just threw out there, some of them are obvious. Some of them are not like senior Seniors is not an obvious choice, but it is a niche that I think that you could uh, address with this film. How did you, f first of all, pick your niches, and then how did you plan to target them? So we just broke down at its core. What um, are this film's two or three major messages? What uh, groups of people would uh, make them say, hell yes, I want to get to know Wally. I want to hear his story. I want to be moved by it. I want to find similarities. Uh, so seniors, of course. And that um, was just kind of a no-brainer based on Wally at the time when we started shooting. He was 82. And his story is so inspirational. And it really plants to seed in other seniors, people who are retired. It's never too late to start a fresh chapter. Mm -hmm. There's always a blank page waiting for you to turn your passion into something profitable to start a business, even if it's crocheting toilet seat covers. If you love crocheting, look at Wally. He turned his love for chocolate chips into a viable concern, and it brings him joy. So I think that's a great lesson for um, seniors. And as you know, today, seniors have never been more active. Mm -hmm. So he thought they'd, they'd dig it. And then, of course, there's the um, entrepreneurial, the small business owners. And I think when I do my kind of phase two revenue run, I will reach out to business schools and I will cut uh, two different versions of this film to sell to the educational space because his story is so chock full of great uh, business lessons that are timeless, really. Um, and that brings a lot of hope. And I'll also, once again, on the phase two revenue scheme, reach out to all these assisted living facilities, retirement communities that are in desperate need of programming. There's activity directors in every one of these um, uh, retirement communities that are dying for fresh content. So instead of just selling them a DVD, I put together a whole activity in a box. So this includes the film, a discussion guide. It includes activities. It, it includes uh, an opportunity to start cl a club. And this really um, eases a lot of their pain. Like, what should we do with all these retirees? Well, I think if you could solve other people's problems with your art, I mean, those are just checks that will hit your account eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so 
that's really the two main niches. I, I considered bakers and, and cookie lovers, but it was too broad early on. Well, um, I mean, to be to be fair, though, like seniors and entrepreneurs are two very broad. Um, they're niches, but they're pretty it, large. They're pretty large. Incredibly broad. Yes. So maybe I didn't drill down enough. I, I got lazy. And I did. I mean, as you know, this is a grueling process mm -hmm. to make the film, to finally get it out. You're pushing it through the creative birthing canal, and it's painful. <laughs> uh, at that point, that's where a lot of filmmakers, they've run out of gas. Not only physical, psychic, creative gas, uh, monetary gas for, for many, and they don't have the juice to take you the next mile. And to me, I know you probably agree, the next mile is the most important. The marketing mile. Oh, absolutely. We better have our best shoes strapped on for that last leg of the journey. Most filmmakers don't understand that before, like when you and I were coming up, making the movie was the toughest part. It was the most expensive right. part. Exactly. There was no yes. access. Um, you know, just doing a color grading session would cost you three hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> you know, right. Right. it was it was insane. But now making the movie technically is the easiest part of the entire filmmaking process, and we've been trained. And Hollywood has been putting out this message that you put out all the audio. You, I mean, you put out all the art first, and then you hand over the business to somebody else to handle. Where in the new film economy, you've got to know everything from script all the way to how to generate revenue with your film. And if you don't understand that that last part after that final cut is cut and the deliverables are ready, you're done. You're done. And and most filmmakers don't get that, but they learn the hard way. They do, and it either drives them away or it makes them stronger once their wounds heal. And to me, this this last um, leg of the race, the, the marketing race, it's it's like it's like climbing a mountain. It's a slog. It's climbing a mountain barefoot through three feet of snow with COVID positive piranhas nipping at your heels just to get to the <laughs> summit, right? right? And for many, the first time they get a blister on their little toe. Oh, I, my feet hurt. I'm going home, and and they throw in the towel. But this is where strength and resilience and perseverance for mm -hmm. us will carry us to the top and get us to the summit where we pop the cork, we celebrate. But not only do I believe is it a win for our own films to make it across the finish line, but it's a win for the whole indie film community because we show it is possible to win. Yeah, absolutely. With self distribution. And the more examples of that, I think the more inspiration it will provide other filmmakers who are maybe too scared to you know, go through the pain of the climb. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the vital, I think, where we're at today. That's one reason I released that, that brutally honest case study, because we have to all be more transparent. If we truly are a community, mm -hmm. it's up to us to start sharing our wins and our losses so we can learn from each other. So, you, so now you've, dis, you've, you've identified your niches uh, and yes. you've identified your audience and you have your film and you've decided to go self-distribution. What platform did you decide to use or platforms did you decide to use to put the film out online? I guess let's one step before that, I had to start generating buzz and market it. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about, because I did spend a good amount of time building the Facebook page. Well, let's, let's to, talk about the, let's talk about the platform yeah. real quick. The next question is all about the marketing. So what platform did got you it, choose? Got it. I used Gumroad. Okay. And then, and you didn't put it on any of the other major platforms, iTunes, Amazon. Oh, oh okay. No, thank you. Thank you, Alex. I'm sorry. That also is part of phase two. Um, I kind of got sidetracked. I wanted to try this launch by myself to market direct to the fans with, uh, to sell and rent stream only. Uh, no, yeah, to own or rent the, the film mm -hmm. through Gumroad, which I control the majority of those profits. And then I'm going to do the whole you know, SVOD, AVOD, TVOD, that still is on the list. Okay. Um, but to date, no, no, I have not ventured into those waters. So I'm excited to get it up on those platforms for sure. All right. So we'll come back to the platforms in your ROI in a second. But how did you now start planning on putting the word out on this film? I think um, two years, two years before I released it, you know, I launched the Facebook page and tried to start building up an audience, producing a ton of original content, custom graphics, uh, memes, uh, clips from the film. So I hustled to um, just drive engagement and to build the numbers. I, I, I boosted posts, I put tons of money in Zuckerberg's pocket, 
with mm -hmm. uh, varying degrees of return. And um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, right before I launched, maybe I had close to 3,000 Facebook fans. Which, and, yeah, which is, it's, yeah. it's, it's not, it, it sounds like a lot, but in the scope of it's, Facebook, it's, it's, it's nothing. Yeah. It's not a whole lot, not for a film launch. Now, Mike, so you decided to focus all of your, your energy towards the Facebook page as opposed to a homepage or a blog or something like that? I, I, yeah. Nope. Uh, you, good, good question. I also had the film's website where I had set up, um, you know, a squeeze page. So a lot of the campaigns on Facebook would be to drive traffic to the, the film website where people, I could capture their email, get them on a news, uh, I get my email list so I could send them newsletters because that's what filmmakers have to, the first thing they need to do is start building their list. That mm -hmm. is so important. Um, and whatever you have to do, I, I, um, I tried a couple different enticements to see what would move the needle. I offered some people uh, his recipe for free. For others, it was uh, a discount movie ticket. And then I tracked what gave me the most bang for the buck. And those are called lead generators for people listening. So that's basically yes. a lead. So you give away a freebie of some sort to get people on your list so you can start building a relationship with them and you provide a tremendous amount of value to them with that lead generation, whatever that might be. Could be a video, could be a PDF, could be a recipe, could be a checklist, it could be a thousand different things as long as it's really irresistible to the audience you're targeting. Um, so that, and then if you don't mind asking, how big was your list when you launched? Pass. <laughs> okay, so the email list. Wait, wait, wait! No, damn it! Now, you're driving me to drink again. I think uh, <laughs> I'm the at. List was pathetic. Okay, it was truly pathetic. It was no, it was like 121. Okay, so big fail, big fail there. Um, All right, so and, uh, okay, so you brought you brought your so you have a, a small, very small email list, um, and you've you focus a lot of energy on Facebook and you're getting people into your funnel and things like that. So out of all of that, and you have Gumroad as your, your main place that you're going to be selling your film. So right. the, um, okay. How much did you spend on Facebook ads on your launch and how many ads did you, spent, did you use? Um, so I ran 121 ads. Now this, okay. keep in mind, this is probably to, you know, uh, through February into February, right to the launch. Mm -hmm. um, 121 ads, I dropped $1,383, uh, mm -hmm. not a penny more in ads. And, <laughs> not, a, and not a penny more. <laughs> hell no. Zuckerberg got enough of my higher, hard earned money. Yeah, yeah, How yeah. dare he? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then uh, this is a, just to build on your last point why it's absolutely crucial to own your audience's info mm -hmm. because with one algorithm change, poof, all um, your connection to your potential fans oh, it's are gone. gone. You don't want any other social overlord to control your fan base. You must be able to reach out directly and communicate with your people. That's why you have to build a list. Well, that's exactly what happened with Facebook originally. If you remember, like we're talking about eight years ago or something like that, you used to be able to post something on your Facebook page and right. 30, 40% of people would see it. Yeah. Now it's... A half a percent um, for free it, it, unless it goes viral, unless it gets shared or unless something else happens organically, generally speaking, it's pay to play. So that changed the business model for millions of companies around the world, million of people around the world overnight. So you always have to play in your own sandbox. You have to control the sandbox because when you play in somebody else's sandbox, you play by their rules. YouTube did the same thing. People were making a lot of money off of their ads and all of a sudden Facebook just went, hey, Amazon, their affiliate marketing pack, they turned, oh, nope, no more. And people lose their minds. So, cause you are, you're completely dependent on that platform. So a hundred percent agree. The email list is the most powerful thing any marketer has more powerful than a million, two million followers on Facebook. It doesn't mean and anything. You're exactly right. And to do it again, I would have focused more effort on pointing all my ads to that landing page. But keep in mind, and I think a lot of indie filmmakers suffer from this early on, we really, <clears throat> we get drunk on the dopamine. Mm -hmm. Seeing the likes and shares, it is intoxicating. They like me, they um, really and, like me. <laughs> oh my God, I don't have to spend money on a therapist, I just have to post something, and I'm loved. <laughs> but 
listen up, you damn indie filmmakers yes. and hustlers. This is really important. Never confuse the like button with the buy button. Mm -hmm. One causes a temporary chemical reaction. The other produces a long-lasting financial one. And never get wooed in by a like or a share because those are meaning they're vanity metrics that won't pay your rent. You can't call your landlord and say, oh, you know what, uh, this month's rent, um, I'm a little short. Do you take likes? Can I? <laughs> I, I can no. give you I can give you 20,000 followers. Is that because I pay my right. rent? Okay. Well, that may have some value if you're offering. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it doesn't because if you're just giving followers away, this, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. You can buy followers. It's right. It's, you can it's buy, empty. Like tomorrow you can spend, I think, I think the number is like twenty or $30,000 and you can have a million followers. It, it, seriously, that's literally the cost of, of buying followers. Um, but it means nothing. It's complete vanity because you, they're people, they're robots or they're fake accounts or they're people from oh, God knows where who have no interest in what you're doing. So it's basically just like, look how cool I am. I remember I spoke to a filmmaker that, that decided to spend, I think he spent like $7,000 on YouTube views to get his trailer to be viewed over a million times. And the movie cost like, you know, it was like a low budget $50,000 like action horror film or something right. like that. With like, you know, I think Michael Madsen was in it um, or Eric Roberts or something like that. So, and he was used in his, his mind um, and he was a little bit out there as far as ego is concerned. And that's saying a lot because we're all crazy. Um, but he then called all the film distributors like, look, there's a million people who saw our film. You've got to buy it. Guess what? It didn't really work. And they lost eight thousand dollars because of it, because that's vanity. Total vanity. It, it's um, com complete and, vanity. And that's the thing. You know, likes can be bought, but sales have to be earned. Mm hmm. And and before it you can, the thing is with sales, uh, especially with independent film, um, you've got to your your value proposition has to be massive. If you're if you're trying to go outside the normal world of like iTunes, Amazon, places where people are very comfortable um, spending their money because their credit cards are already on file. They just click a little button and it's, it's right. done when you're going to a platform like Gumroad or Vimeo uh, Vimeo or something like that. That they are, they don't know who this is. So now you want me to pull out my credit card, type it into the site that I have no idea about to watch a documentary about cookies or to watch an independent film that I made about filmmakers running around Sundance. Like it doesn't, you know, it's 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 not it's not a good business strategy. Uh, and I love Gumroad. Don't get me wrong. I think they're great. Um, and VHX before they were bought by Vimeo was great as well. Right. But it you're adding another few layers to the process, which creates uh, less sales. So let me ask you, um, since you've been so for, for forthcoming with your numbers, out of that thousand, what was it, $1,100 and 83 cents? 1383, 1383, Alex. okay, 1383. <laughs> right. Out of that 1383, what was your ROI? What was your return on investment? So these numbers, I think, covered the first two weeks of launch. That was all point of that video, to say, hey, this is what self-distribution can do for you if you follow all the steps the gurus give you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the grand total that week was $36.94. Now that's a but, that's 36 American. USD, my USD. friend, no Bitcoin. I, okay. But, but, but keep in mind, but then I, it, it was, that was already depressing enough, but then I said, oh, it's not 36 because to test Gumroad, I did a couple right. test transactions. Oh, so now man. I have to. So the grand total now, let me check my math here, was $29.96 for a launch wow. of a film that took five years, 1383 bucks uh, in advertising. Um, wah, wah, wah. Yeah, exactly. Thanks plan. Yeah. So, so do you mind if I can kind of dissect this the situation a little bit? Get your chainsaw out. Uh, I want. I want to. I want to because I want to. I think this is a really great, and I think why you put the video out originally, and I will put that in the show notes. That video is amazing. That it's like forty, almost an hour. Um, oh, yeah. it's, it's insane. A manifesto. It's a yeah. manifesto. It's a fantastic video. <laughs> um, I think because you, you want to help filmmakers, so I think this is a great learning moment. So you did a lot of the concepts right. You you found an, you you have a niche product 
which is a niche a film that's aimed at certain groups, which you could arguably get to. Um, it is yes. a valuable, a, pro, a good value proposition because there really isn't anything like this out there. Um, no. And then the now that's the good stuff. And you and you 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 wanted to self distribute. You put it on a platform so you can control the money. Also good. Um, there's a lot of that stuff. And then you started doing targeted Facebook ads. And you even started building an email list to a certain extent. So I think you've discussed it already. We said it already. The, the biggest mistake you made is all these ads that you were spending money on were not into a funnel, were not directly aimed at that email building list. Now, real quick before you slaughter me. Um, <laughs> I don't want, a lot of, I don't want to Good point. No, no, I, I know. <laughs> Guys, I'm not beating him up, guys. Listen, I'm not beating him up. No. We've, this is why no, we're he's here. Not. No, he's being incredibly <laughs> kind. Um, two other things I did, uh, or I attempted to do, but um, the other parties bailed on, but I really believe in, and I think this is really key for, especially documentary filmmakers, I reached out to influencers mm -hmm. who I felt um, would uh, gel with this film, who, who have an audience that totally would love Wally's message. And let's say, for example, uh, a business blogger, one of the top business uh, bloggers has a podcast, a decent audience. And I analyze, and I think every filmmaker, you should come up with the spreadsheet where you, you put, you list all the influencers that, that could relate to your niche. And then you also put um, all other social numbers. How many followers do they have? That's important. You want to align yourself with big, beefy networks. Um, I reached out to him. I said, hey, listen, I want to try something new for marketing a film. I'd like to work with you and create a course. I want to create a course that um, uses Wally's story to really drive home some of the principles you teach, mm -hmm. uh, part of your mission statement. And you, you'll watch the film. You'll pull out five key business lessons in this film, and then I'll produce it for you. We offer it to your audience as an add-on to the film. Or if you want to give it away uh, as a value add, great. But uh, you make a course because, as you know, courses are huge. And all these guys are looking for fresh content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I thought it would have been a slam dunk. And I got one or two people on the hook, and then they just they vaporize. But I think that is key because then they, they have skin in the game, and they're going to work to promote this course that they can then monetize themselves. So I recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. Education, online education, especially post COVID, is um, is yes. huge, 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 huge. Uh, and as I'm sure you following what I do, I've I've added a tremendous amount of education to my oh, business. Um, yeah. And and that's something that I've because that's what the audience wants. That's what my 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 tribe wants. What my customers want. Um, and the people that I I'm, I'm trying to serve want. Um, so yes, absolutely. In my book, Film uh, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I talk about courses as one many of many ways you could do it. So to break, get back to your yeah. So that was an so aside, to break down. Yeah, so like, uh, if I was gonna if I was gonna go down this road with this film, um, I would have first and foremost I would have seen if there was you see you couldn't go after another cookie company because he's competing with another cookie company. So that that you can't kind of leverage that. You might have to, you could maybe find some sort of entrepreneurial organizations, um, nonprofits, things like that, that you could have maybe partnered with um, to get the word out, get on their email list, start leveraging their emails list. Um, and then why you haven't created a course specifically on entrepreneurial course of your own based off of his, that's something you should be doing because I think you'll make a lot more money selling that course off of his yeah. name and, and cut him into right. it, by the way, and cut, you know, give him. Oh, I yeah, I plan to. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So you, you partner with him on a course, on entrepreneurial course, and that's a huge, that would be a huge, huge moneymaker revenue. It's kind of like really low hanging fruit in my mind where I see this personally as the film is a lead, a lead generator. It's a, it's a loss leader. There is, if you can make some money with it, great. But if you can't, it's all good. You should be able to generate enough other things um, that could do it. Like if you could reach out to uh, Sir Sir Latab or um, those kind of like chefy bakey kind of companies, and see if you can incorporate into their world somehow, where you give the movie away. Look, um, Fact Sick and Nearly Dead did this so beautifully. Yes. Uh, I use them as a case study in my book, and he literally gave the movie away, and he partnered with the Breville juicer in the movie. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And now when I went to go buy my Breville juicer, because that's the juicer I was going to buy, because that's the movie I saw. So it was great marketing. Right. I went to Bed Bath & Beyond. And when I went to go buy it, guess what was sitting right next to it? A DVD of the movie. If you buy it, you get a copy of the movie for free. And it, it just was, he built Brilliant. an entire business around this concept of juicing. Um, there's potential for that here in the cookie side of things, in the baking side of things. You can partner with uh, companies in regards to um, how you how you create uh, you know baking educational baking uh, packages there's so many different things that you can do to kind of combine him and and uh, the film and trying to generate other revenue sources obviously t-shirts uh, hats aprons uh, baked goods things like that but if you're able to create this but you're now creating an ecosystem uh, with right. your film and if you can create that ecosystem, and I think that's one place where you could you could do probably a bit better now is, is actually not focused on so much on the getting the revenue from the movie itself, but from all these other revenue sources because it is a it's a it's a absolutely film entrepreneurial play. Like it, the movie is a giveaway almost. One hundred percent, and there's a real evergreen quality to it too. Absolutely. Um, and that's something, like I said, for phase two, it's institutional sales, too. It's reaching out, like I said, to the, the senior homes, business yeah. schools, and, right. and, and repackaging it in that form. And I think, I, I forget which hotel chain, maybe um, Radisson, they, one of their trademarks is they actually leave out hot chocolate chip cookies for guests. So I've, um, a while back, you know, I, I try to in, be in contact with them to why not put Wally's face on these cookies or use his recipe and we could put the D we could stream the movie on the, the hotel mm -hmm. uh, video on demand systems for a couple months airlines. Um, All there day. was a Midwest express. Uh, uh, it was a Wisconsin based airline years ago. Used to give out hot chocolate chip cookies. Oh, yeah. Once again, pivot, give out Wally's new cookie and you get to watch his, the movie free in the, um, in, in the seat back. Or stream it in. On is the there plane. a package? So, is there, is, do you have a, a package where you get cookies and the movie for sale? Early on, yes. But once again, the thing with Wally is when we embarked on this this journey, he actually had kind of a good thing going. He had started a cookie company called Cookie Kahuna, which yeah. when you watched him on Shark Tank, that was the company he was promoting. But wouldn't you know it? A couple months before we release, he splits from that company. Thank you. Moment oh, of God. silence. Oh, moment of silence. And then for all the money that's left on the table. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to pull the bottle up again uh, and drink. I already did that when it happened. But yeah, he really threw us for a curve. But then the story only got a little more juicy because then he, he had to do so. He had to leave his home state to try to start another company. And he was a victim of elder abuse in this other state he went to. So the story got really wacky. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of in true Wally form. He's and he'll tell you he's never been a good businessman. He's a great marketer, but he never truly, you know, understood okay. the whole business thing. Well, I mean, but even right. even even that you can go down to Costco and buy cases of famous Amos cookies and package them yourself right. and sell them. <laughs> I mean, you could arguably, right? <laughs> there is, yeah, there is. Exactly. You know, like if he's like, look, I mean, if you could you could do something like that. I mean, there is there is um, there's a lot of potential here. Um, I think you said yes. this you said this in the in your video. It's like it wasn't lack of plan as much as it was execution um, and figuring out 100%. those kind of dialing in those certain things. Because if like if I was trying like it's serious, like if I sat there and started thinking about how to market this, I would be creating uh bigger value propositions like crazy like cookie packages and baking and all these other kind of revenue streams and seeing what i can leverage as far as um audiences through other companies and things like that as opposed to going down the road of and influencers are great um and going down the business side is great and i love your ideas with the senior living and the um cruise lines and and airlines mm -hmm. and uh, business schools and and all that that's Excellent. I know. I know. One documentary filmmaker made over a million dollars with a senior-based uh, film. Well, with the Age of Champion guys. Yeah. Keith yeah. Those guys. Yeah. And Chris. Yeah. Yeah. They 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 killed. And it. I based a lot of this on them. They're incredible what they did. 
Yeah, and I think you could go to that same senior living convention once COVID is done, right? And yes. sell and sell yes. licenses there. I just, just no question, you could do that as well. So there is definitely a bright future for the great cookie comeback. There is definitely a bright future. Um, so we've discussed what you've done right and a few things that you did wrong as well. Um, let me see. Hold on a second. Because uh, we covered a bunch. Now, did the, so, so, yeah, we covered a lot of stuff already. <laughs> I mean, if you want to if you want to dive into, I did get a couple offers from distributors. So, OK, so with distributors specifically, because I'm I, let me tell you what the let me see if I can guess. So, OK, yes, let me see so if I can guess these deals. Um, no money up front. No, MG. so no MGs. OK, great. So no money up front. I'm going to say it's going to be an eight to 10 year length, give or take. If I was lucky, but okay. I yeah. All prior. right. A little 15 years. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to be nice. It's about 50. It's yeah. about 15 years, right? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Then there was uh, also um, call, the marketing expenses, of course, which they'll cap. Um, and it's going to range, I'm going to say, on the less predatory side, 50,000, on the more predatory side, 100,000. Um, a little lower, but yeah. Um, 40,000, 30,000. I don't think they, they, yeah, yeah. Like 20, 20,000. Okay. So that was actually, that's not a bad marketing cap, but then that means you'll never see. Not, I'll never see anything. Anything. You'll never see anything. It's basically right. a loss leader at that point. Um, those were the deals you were gotten, but that's the standard deal. And if you would have been a lesser filmmaker in the sense of your knowledge, you would have just bought, bid on one of those and prayed because you're like, oh, it only cost me 15 grand. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll get at least that back. Um, Never. Which you won't, which you won't. No. And thanks to guys like you and Rob Hardy. I mean, you've, you're really um, rattling the cages and shouting this from the mountaintops <laughs> and you're keeping us awake and it's all of our responsibilities to stay sober. And not be wooed, because once again, just like likes and shares, it's very intoxicating when you get an email, a return email from a distributor. Oh my God, they like my film. And then you know the the Hollywood red carpet fantasy starts playing in your in your mind. Mm -hmm. But no, you have to shut that down. You got to pull the plug on that projector, um, because it rarely ever works out that way. And um, it's just it's like waiting. It's it's high school prom all over again, where you wait till a week before the big dance to ask a girl out. And your options are so limited by then, and you're really nervous, and you're desperate. They all smell that on you, and you get a bunch <laughs> of no's in the day three, two days before the prom, and eventually this one girl says yes, and you're so uh, uh, elated and relieved, despite her reputation. Uh, <laughs> she still said yes. Right. The, the chances that she'll show up or, or actually be there at midnight or dance with you. Uh, when Cindy Lauper comes on time after time, well, obviously, very low. isn't this the beginning of every Blake Edwards film? <laughs> I think so. And maybe that's what I'm channeling now. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, Blake Edwards. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, oh, and then by the end of the evening, absolutely no distributing will be going on. No, I, I, there'll be no distributing. None. No distributing. <laughs> no distributing at all is going to happen. Um, now, did you think of possibly going with a film aggregator to get your film up on these platforms? Is that something you're thinking about yes. doing? A hundred percent. And this is an area that I really haven't dipped my toe in the water enough. I mean, Film Hub uh, seems very intriguing. No. Oh, I'm sorry. That was Are just you... a twitch in my neck. I apologize. Oh, oh, oh gotcha. I think it was Freudian. I'm going to re replay the video. <laughs> um, but aside from them... <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, who should I call? We're all, all of us are on the edge of our futons, Alex. Um, <laughs> what are some good aggregators? <laughs> Futon. I'm um, teetering on the edge. Well, because because of the um, the whole distributor debacle and and how yeah. I heavily promoted them for two years, it's one of the reasons uh, why I came right. out so heavily, guns a blaring against them when I found out what happened. Um, I tr I try not to recommend any specific mm. company because a company that could be Got good it. right now is not a company that's going to be good six months from now. And I found that anytime I release one of these podcasts, they are evergreen. And I hear people are like, oh, I, I went with this distributor because they were on your show. And then I'm like, oh, but they're not good anymore um, because they did this or that and their company is this now. And I have to delete that episode. So I. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I've 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 become ever since distributor I've become very militant. So I I 
if I if I hear any negative thing about a past company or, or guest that I've spoken to that could possibly harm filmmakers, I go back and delete it. And I delete it from everywhere. Well, thank you. On, on behalf of all of us, thank you. Because we do look to you and others in the space for kind of sage advice. Because we don't have access to these big guys. So you're in a really, I think, a, uh, a unique position, and you know it, to be able to, to bring us uh, people that we cannot connect with. So we take that to be almost an endorsement when I get your position. But the the deal I got was from a guest from one of your past podcasts, a distributor that I have to check their library to see if they're still on. Not to say... Oh, I know they, who they are. Like sharks. Oh, I, I know exactly not, who... They, I, you Just by the terms, I knew who they were. And they are, right, no, lo exactly. and they are no longer on the, on the podcast. Right. Yeah. Rhymes with crappy toss. But... Um, <laughs> which was the nature of the deal. <laughs> it's really crypt. No one will get that. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, sir. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, Oh, what a world. What, been. what a world it is. It, it is. Uh, it's, it's an insane world and it's getting insaner. Um, you know, can 2020 be over with please? Um, uh, it's a general statement, <laughs> let alone everything else. If I would have told you, in January, that not only will the entire world shut down and the economy would shut down in the United States, but all movie theaters will be closed. There would be no summer blockbuster season whatsoever um, without any real foreseeable future of um, movie theaters coming back to what they are. And that the only lone film that might hold some sort of theatrical hope, and it's a, it's a, it's a, Hail Mary, not because of the film, but because of the circumstance, is a film that has very few stars in it, and it's based on a f uh, based on an original IP created by Christopher Nolan called Tenet, and and right. yes. that and, and and don't get me wrong with Robert Patterson and stuff like that, but you know they're not it's not a giant Marvel film. So actually, the Marvel, DC, and James Bond films were pushed because <laughs> they were scared. But they're hoping the tenant might open, and they're still talking of like, as of this recording, eh, you know, it might, we might, we might hold on to it. I don't know. That's a two hundred million dollar plus gamble theatrically, big time. And by the way, yeah. you have to watch that film theatrically. That's the way you watch a Christopher yep. Nolan film. You watch right. it in IMAX if at all possible. But if I would have told you all of that, you would have said, Alex, you're insane. You're insane. Put the bottle down, Alex. <laughs> Come on, exactly. But that's the world we uh, live in, and and I've been and you know I've been saying this for a while that Rome is burning, uh, and and the coronavirus unfortunately has added a lot of um, gasoline to that fire in our industry, and it's gonna it's never gonna die, but it will shift, uh, and us as filmmakers need to shift with it, need to pivot, need to figure out new ways to make this work, and use the new technology at our disposal that we can use to empower us, let a, instead of. It defeating us. So to go back to what you were saying, as far as aggregators are concerned, I'm not sure that it makes financial sense to go with an aggregator for your mm -hmm. film. And I'll tell you why. Because okay. if you're spending money uh, to get on iTunes for TVOD. No, never. I'd never do iTunes. Okay. So for a film like this, there's so little, what I've heard, there's so little return on investment. I'm not going to spend a grand and a half to make twenty four dollars. Correct, yeah. exactly. So, Through iTunes. so iTunes, yeah. you're not gonna. Right. Well, first and foremost, TVOD as a general statement is pretty much a dead. It's dead for independent filmmakers unless you could drive traffic. I agree. Unless you could right. drive tremendous amount of traffic to those spaces, then mm -hmm. you can make. But being found organically, yet not not gonna happen. So, um, iTunes, Google Play, Fandango, and those kind of TVOD places, not yeah. worth it. Amazon, you could upload yourself. It will take a lot longer if you upload it yourself other than if you would went with you know another a distribution company or an aggregator. But you could up do it yourself, and they do take a big chunk, but they are the biggest um, marketplace where everybody's on it and everybody's comfortable hitting that, 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 that rental. Definitely. I, if you're going to put it on TVOD, I would put it up for 99 cents because it's better mm -hmm. than the three cents you're going to get per hour screened um, on Amazon Prime. So 
that would be my suggestion. Don't spend three to four, five thousand dollars with an aggregator to get them on all these platforms because that's a mistake that a lot of filmmakers make. And you really should try to focus your energies as much as you can on one major platform, if at all possible. And I think Amazon will probably be the best bet for you. If you can find a way to get on AVOD, that's where I yes. think your money's going to be made. Um, and right. I, I think AVOD is right now, as, as of this recording, AVOD is where the money is. And I agree. Like Tubi TV. Tubi, Pluto, um, Peacock yep. uh, is coming out. Uh, there's so many right. of these, um, these AVOD platforms coming out where that's the only place people are making money right now. In six months, I have no idea. In a year, I have no idea. But right now, that's where money is made. Like, like when I released my first feature, I sold it to Hulu. That's not possible mm. now. Not, no. not, not possible now. Not I, sold, I actually sold it to China through a foreign distributor. Not possible wow. now. <laughs> not possible oh, no. now. Um, so there's moments of time that things are available. Like there was a moment for TVOD in 2010, 11, 12, 13. TVOD was kill. It was killing it. SVOD was nah, yeah. and there was no AVOD. Then SVOD started picking up, and and so on. Um, you might, and this is a big might, you might want to talk to a good qualified producer's rep to see mm -hmm. if they can pitch it to um, a Netflix or a, a, a streaming platform and see if they would take it take it on. Um, I actually will, Glenn Reynolds and Sebastian Tordes, both mm -hmm. of them have been on the show. Uh, they're both really good producer's reps who actually do what they say they can do and they actually care about filmmakers might be a possibility no they don't exist Come i on. know they're they're That's unicorns true. they're actually unicorns in the space but um that might be a possibility as well um again right. it's a conversation it's a conversation it is and, not a, a guarantee but it's a conversation it's it's worth having I, I did speak with a couple of producers reps and they just really turned i i like in your other job do you sell used cars yeah they're, they're really slick <laughs> And slimy. Yeah, most producers, reps, most sales agents, um, you know, a lot of them are very predatory and a lot of them are very slow. Oh, yeah, I can get you this. Oh, I can get you that. And I can yeah. do this and I could do that. And like, you know, look, guys, do you believe you can make some money with this film? Make a freaking phone call. Submit it to Netflix. If you make it, we're going to cut. We'll cut. We'll cut the deal. All right. If not, forget moving it. On. Yeah, moving on. Yeah, you know, exactly. um, that's what I need you for. If you can make it happen, great. Let's cut a deal. If not, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of money for one platform, you know, or, or this or that. It's just not that kind of film. Um, but those, those are those are some of the avenues I think you can go down. But listen, man, I, I appreciate, um, Jeff, that you've come on and um, talk so freely about this process. It is a rarity. I do, anytime filmmakers want to do this, I generally, if it's a good story, I definitely want to bring them on the show because I've had a few of these bad distribution story kind of uh, situations on the show and they're very popular people love them and i think it's a real yeah. good service to the community to actually hear people who are in the trenches going through it figuring it out but what i love about you is that that was 1.0 release 1.0 now you're planning release 2.0 which is a whole other world um and please let me know what happens with re release 2.0 i'd love to hear what happens how you're able to generate revenue. I think you have a lot of potential with this film. There's a, just there's a lot of money that could be made, um, and it could help a lot of people too watching this, insp inspirational wise and and things. And and that's the goal: turning a loss into a win. And these are all I think losses are real. They're teachable moments, and to mm -hmm. lean into it because I was kind of in, uh, part of me struggled. Do I really want to release this to the world and say, "Hey, I failed"? But um, the community has <sighs> been really supportive. And um, and I have to give a shout out. You know who kind of inspired this was a guest you had on your show, Naomi. Yes, McDougal. Naomi McDougal Jones. Right, her her bite me film. She did the whole cross country mm -hmm. tour and the bus. She's amazing. And she cut an incredible YouTube series, which I implore every filmmaker to watch. Mm -hmm. Her little her road trip series. It is available. Incredibly, it's available on uh, on Indie Film Hustle TV. Oh, wonderful! Watch it. You'll learn a ton, and maybe it'll light a fire under you. Yeah, she uh, was great. Try something new. And she interviewed a couple filmmakers who then I brought on as well, who, who had a horrible distribution uh, deal as well. And they, they actually right. were like, they were brutal. They just like, oh. this is the company, and this is what they did to me. <laughs> And they haven't paid me, so screw them. And this is, don't say, I'm like, okay, all right, let's do this. Yeah, how do you really feel? <laughs> yeah, 
but th th that's so important. Um, and to your audience, I just want to follow up with thank you for posting the, 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 the manifesto, but to let everyone know, if they actually make it through that and they're still standing, mm -hmm. um, we want to continue the educational process and offer a free course. Yeah. That's where I teamed up with Rob Hardy, your buddy. And for people who watch the video, they could opt in, and we, we were like delivering over an hour and a half of free content to arm people with the right steps to find a niche and market to them directly. That's um, awesome. That's totally free. Yeah, I'll put, it, I'll put all that in the show notes without question. Thank now, you. what's, ne what's next you. for you? So uh, <laughs> two days after the lockdown orders came, and you're in L.A., you remember those texts the, the, the mayor sent out. I'm, st I'm still um, getting I'm still getting texts about the riots, sir. So. Oh right, the curfew. Uh oh, we're <laughs> we're cutting it close. We we better wrap this up and shut the shades. But uh, I had met a guy at a, a party in um, a couple months earlier, and this party I only found out the next day on Facebook. It was a who's who of former child stars. Like every child actor was at this party. It was a, a birthday party for a guy I used to go to junior high with, and he actually was a pretty big child star, Keith Coogan. His grandpa was Jackie Coogan. He was in. Why is that name he was so in familiar? Like, uh, okay, he was in uh, Adventures in Babysitting. Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toy Soldier, every '80s TV show. So I contact this guy who hosted the party, who happened to be a screenwriter, and I said, "Hey, Ryan, um, we're not doing anything now. Let's do something wacky and creative. Let's come up with a show that we could, you know, put child actors in, um, and shoot it all on Zoom." So we came up with the first kind of scripted Zoom comedy. It's called The Quarantine Bunch. And we've got like six former child stars on here. Even Ted Lange from The Love Boat. Isaac, he makes an appearance and some nice. other guest stars. And it's a hoot. The premise is all these child stars, you know, the reputation, they're all a little. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Holy trauma. It's, yeah. it's called fault. Thank you. You said it. Um, so they used to have a support group where they met in person. But since oh. the quarantine, now they have all their meetings on Zoom where everyone could tune into their drama. So the quarantine bunch was born and it's a fun little show, but it just shows the necessity of being able to pivot when you can no longer produce content in a way you're used to. We have to quickly turn on a dime and, and channel our creativity in another format. And, and um, well, you, first of all, you had me at support group um, now, um, <laughs> but like, <laughs> and this is something that filmmakers of today don't understand is that you know, when you and I were coming up, it, everything was pretty well established. Like yes. things really cool. hadn't changed in, I mean, occasional little things here. VHS showed up. It kind of threw a little monkey wrench in. Right. Then, um, then DVD showed up. Cable. Remember cable was going to knock oh, everything wow. out. Z channel, select TV. Yeah. yeah. All right. this. Uh, so there's things. And then, you know, but then it's once, it, once Netflix showed up in, in 08, re, in, in the, in the streaming space, not in the other space, in the DVD rental space, but in the streaming space, everything's accelerated so quickly that the marketplace, the technology, everything has changed so much. Prior to the 90s, really, I mean, when I went to, when I went to college, I learned on a flatbed. But I also learned on that Sony and the CMX 3600. Let's let's start dating yes, myself. Yes. The Grass Valley as well. Uh, but yeah, then yeah. I, I used the... Um, now, this is for the for the old folks listening. The montage as my editing. Yes, yes the montage. Right. The montage was the the nonlinear editing system I learned on, which was on Windows 311. Um, and then I would take the floppy and walk it over to the CMX 3600, plug it in and try to get that EDL to work, which it never did. Um, Good luck. It never did. But then by the time I graduated, um, DV uh, mini DV started showing up and then HD started yeah, showing up right, and right. then avid showed up and then every, so it was kind of like, it was just weird. I was right in the middle of the shift. So I, I, a lot of the stuff I learned in school was pretty much useless. Like I, I know what time code is. I know what drop frame is, you know, all this kind of stuff that I, I needed back then betas, SPs and digi betas and all that stuff. I mean, all that kind of crazy title safe. Oh, titles. Thing. Can remember my, titles. My, my wife works in uh, movie trailers, uh, movie yeah. marketing, and the, the, the young bucks who come in there, um, 
when they they kick back a spot because it wasn't QC'd properly, and yeah. they come to my wife and say, uh, what, "What's this thing called? Uh, titles? Aren't, aren't the t- <laughs> titles safe already? Because they're on a screen. No, nothing's threatening them." Oh um, my god! But yes. Yeah, it's these little things. Uh, but but then but, but now. Then it did, no, no, but that, but then you have to pivot because things started changing so rapidly. You know, I went from a, an avid editor to a Final Cut editor because I couldn't find any right. work as an avid editor in my market because there everybody started using Final Cut because everyone started all these in-house agencies and, and in-house uh, production companies started buying Final Cuts because it was more affordable. So I learned that. Then I right. jumped into color. Then I jumped into post supervising. Then I was directing, you know, not just commercials but other things. So it was just this constant pivoting and shifting. Where if you you're like, oh, I'm only going to make my movie this way and I'm going to get it out this way, you're done. You've got to pivot. You've got to be able to change. And you have to continue to evolve. If you don't keep evolving, you start devolving, and mm-hmm. then you do a circular spiral back into the earth from where you came. And I think for a lot of a lot of filmmakers. The seed is planted. I'm, you're a movie guy. The seed is planted early on when we went into the theater. Oh. We were mesmerized by the flicker, the 24 frames per second flicker of dreams on the screen. And we love these icons, our, our, our film heroes. And a lot of filmmakers still think that's the only way they can produce their, their craft, their art, is through the template that their icons used. Correct. And that doesn't – I remember I was, I remember I was coming up and I just – in 2005, I released the DVD. Um, that I sold to uh, to filmmakers about how I made a movie, a short film back then. And in 2005, oh. there was no online education. There was no educational products for independent filmmakers. I know it's hard to believe, but there was none. And I decided um, at that point, I, and I made $100,000 off of a short film and, and, and we sold 5,000 units and we did a lot of great stuff back then. But I was, right. if you go back to YouTube, I actually have, the first tutorials, filmmaking tutorials up on YouTube. It's still there. Uh, oh, that's awesome. And I, but I Do you stopped. cringe when you watch it? Uh, no, it's actually really fun. Oh, they're, they're fun. I mean, they're an SD and they're Your hair quality. was nice. That, that, uh, yeah, 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 I look, I look yeah. so much better than I do now. Um, but oh. um, but the, the, the problem, the point is that I decided not to keep going down that educational route. One, because no one knew what YouTube was going to be and no one knew what the whole, I didn't see that much ahead. But secondly, I said, well, Spielberg never did this. Why should I? Scorsese never uh, did this. I, I'm yes, not going to like I don't yes. I'm not going to be an educator. I'm not going to go down this road or do something else that my icon, my my idols didn't do. And you can't think that way. You've got to think about what's new, what's the space, what's the technology, what are the platforms? How can I get my message out? How can I move my career forward? When I jumped into podcasting 5 years ago, there was a lot of podcasts out there. But not nearly as many yeah. as there are now. It's in the filmmaking space now. It's everybody has a filmmaking podcast, but I'm one of the few that have stayed. I'm I'm one of the few that survived these last five years, where a lot of my contemporaries decided to just you know leave. Um, but it's because I found that niche. I was like, oh, well, there's not there's somewhere here I can make some noise here, uh, as opposed to jumping onto YouTube and trying to do it there. So it's always about pivoting. It's always about shifting and and adjusting and putting more tools in that toolbox. And staying persistent, and I think that's really at the foundation of your success is you remain vigilant and persistent, mm-hmm. and where most don't. Once again, we come back to the the, the views um, conundrum where it's tough to create content these days. There's a lot of competition. There's so much noise out there, signal to noise. Oh, my God, how do you pierce through it? And it is only through con- consistent creative output, and that's a lot of work to feed the beast. But then when you don't get the views, the social proof, I mean, it's easy just to turn tail and say, you know what? I put eight videos up. They didn't hit. I'm going home. I'm trying something new. So to, to stick with it and get over the hump like like you did with your podcast, mm-hmm. that's really the formula for success these days. Oh, just show it's up. Just, just digging down. Huh? Just sh- showing up is half the battle. hundred percent. And you don't have to be perfect. Don't wait till you have it all. Just you, go. you learn as you go, but keep producing. Absolutely. Building your library. Absolutely. No question. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you if you get a question to ask all my guests, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? I'd say really explore a good trade school. I mean, refrigerators always need repairing. <laughs> Plumbers are in demand, especially Boats, during this time. Boat it's engines. Really clogged toilets. Boat engines. Oh, boat engines to get the hell out, out of the, the country. <laughs> uh, don't. But, but if you have to. 
Yes. If you're so moved uh, by your inner uh, child to pick up a camera, um, I mean, really stay sober about this big career choice hmm. and make really smart decisions. Don't give all your money to a school with the, the promise that they're going to arm you with the tools and the career possibilities because they won't. You don't won't. need anyone but yourself in an Internet connection to be a self-taught success story. So don't spend money on a film school. I'm sorry, I, that pisses off a lot of people who are still in debt to their film schools. But you don't need that static anymore because you've got the only tool you need um, to start creating. Oh no, there, yeah, there's um, so much, so much education out there, either free or even paid at a much, much more affordable rate than it is to to go to a film school. Which, honestly, when you start film school, if you go in there for four years, do you think everything you're learning is going to be even up to date by the time you're out? <laughs> Like, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, journalism schools up to three years ago, they still were focusing heavily on print. I mean, hello, um, this is Sign of the Times calling. It's uh, 2020, maybe you've heard. Yeah, it's... It, it, it's... it's a disservice. They really, I mean, it's such a, a disservice because then you put someone in a vice grip, an economic vice grip. Oh, and it's around you your neck. You give them relevant information mm -hmm. and you get them on the hook for the next 20 years to pay you for information that won't produce a dime in their pocket. That pisses me off. It it's, does. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's all about I, ROI. I, yeah. And you have to stay focused on that. And some of some the peers will say, oh, no, but I, I'm an artiste. I fixed my beret. I can't focus on the money. But if you don't focus on the money, you'll never have the backing to create your art and buy your berets. So there, there's a balance. <laughs> and your monocle. Don't forget the monocle. Oh. Um, the monocle, sir. Um, and, and let me ask you, uh, I went to film school. I went to a trade school. I went to full sale. And my, my education was fairly affordable um, at the time. Uh, ask me how many times I've shown my degree or have been asked for my degree. Uh, Alex, how many times have you shown your degree? Never once. Has what? anyone asked me, where did you go to school? Let me see your degree. What are your qualifications? Where's your? They just go, can you do the job I'm going to hire you to do? Do you have a reel? Do you have a resume? Do you have references? That's all I care about. We are carnies. And the sooner people understand, we're te high-tech carnies. That's what the film industry is built on. High-tech carnies who either are in post in a closet like I was for many years or on set directing or on set, you know, doing other jobs, you are a carny in one way, shape, a high-tech carny. And in the carny world, they don't care about credentials. <laughs> no, but in the carny world, it's all about your game. Yep. It has to stop someone for a second, catch an eye, hook a heart, Correct. grab someone, and then it's your patter. And you have to bring something very different that someone else in that marketplace can't bring. So once again, it's really getting in touch with your unique, I'm sorry for the cliche, unique value offering to the world. And you can't be scared off by maybe going down a different path. Um, it's so important to stand out these days and have the courage to be your unique self. Because well, the market wants that. I mean, we're in this era of you know, authenticity. And uh, authentic storytelling as a currency. So lean into that. I think that's what the market really wants more of these days. It's the only um, value. One you more have. tip: Th this episode's going on three hours, but I thank you, Skype, for not shutting the servers down. Um, another tip for for young filmmakers, sure. and this really helped me, uh, especially if you're thinking about going into documentary. Mm -hmm. I learned so much of every facet of the process by working in TV news, mm. because you have to be a one man band. Um, and it may not, it may be cause an eye roll. Oh, I don't want to tell those kind of stories. No, you're not there for that. You eventually will tell the stories you want to tell, but you learn every facet of the technical process and you become very quick. And that is really key. I don't want filmmakers laboring for five years. There's zero ROI if you spend five years on a project. Um, you need to turn your, 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 your productions around much quicker and spend less money on them. That's yeah. Just, yeah. Like you made your, you made your film for $15,000 and that's not, that's doable because of your tools and the toolbox you've put over the years. hundred percent. Or else if you would have to pay people to do your jobs oh. and you would just be the artist, don't forget if you were just the artist and you had your beret, that's a hundred fifty, two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollar job, um, film. And same thing goes with yep. me with my last film. I, I, I spent around $3,000 making my feature, oh but my it was, God. But it was a, you know, it was a different ball game. You, but it was a, yeah. a, I just did a lot of it myself and hired key people that I, and when I say key, there's three, um, you know, other than wow. the actors. 
And you, but I did that because I have 20 odd years under my belt and I have a lot of tools in my toolbox and I carried a lot of that weight on my own shoulders. If not, that movie cost, you know, a hundred thousand bucks, you know, if we do it right. There's no way to get that back as indie filmmakers where a lot of us are. So you right. really have to, um, to learn the craft so you can perform at all levels of it, not rely on others. Mm -hmm. And we know people, older filmmakers who still bring on a, a DP, a sound person, and they have to hire a crew of five, which maybe you and I can single handedly do. Correct. Uh, Correct. And it's all just different. But and, and try, I think the generation coming up behind us uh, and behind them, uh, they're very self-sufficient and they're handling. Definitely. And that's exciting. That is exciting. Yes. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Um, this sounds really crappy. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's multifaceted. Um, nobody gives a damn oh, absolutely. about your film. Nobody they don't, cares. or, or you. The fun. And that is, um, it's liberating once you can lean into that zero expectations from the world or your audience. Uh, and it's on us to help people care about something that is important to us. And you can find a common ground to where People will lean in a little if you're offering them something of value. But also, uh, you're not a slave to what the, the market thinks of your work. If this, if this project causes you joy while you're creating it, wow, that is 100% ROI. Your happiness um, during the creation process is huge. That can never be discounted. And we forget that once we labor for a year or two, we, we put it online and it just flops. And we think because we got 1,253 views, it's a failure. But we, we forget how much, you know, fun we had and how much we learned mm -hmm. during the process of making it. Yes, without question. Great answer. And three of your favorite films of all time. I knew you were going to ask that. Uh, it, honestly, I'm not a real film guy. Uh, Th three of your favorite documentaries. Fa documentaries no, of not all time. Even, okay. I do have some favorite. My favorite film is Airplane. Oh, Far so I don't good. know if anyone's ever given you that answer. Yes. Oh, it has. It's been on the show. It's a fantastic. Oh, really? You could turn on Airplane right now and piss yourself. Yes. It's so funny. I picked the wrong day to start sniffing glue. I mean, it's just right. so good. You ever been in a cockpit? You ever seen a grown man naked? Um, <laughs> Did you spend any time in... No, do you really like watching Barbar uh, Do you like watching barbarian films, Johnny? Have you ever seen... Yeah. Have you spent any time in a Turkish prison? In a Turkish prison? <laughs> like, it's just like, it's so and, good. And, there's Easter eggs throughout that you could watch oh. it like 10 times and you'll find something new oh, to laugh so at. So good. So good. And it's, I actually, I sat on the plane um, next to, we were going to Beijing for a project um, next to one of the, I'm, I'm blanking on who are the two guys? Um, J, A, is it J? Abrams. J, Abrams. Abrams and Zucker. 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 Zuckerman. I sat next to Zucker. 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 Jerry Zucker. Uh, yeah, Jerry, yeah. Um, hilarious guy. But uh, I mean, I love quirky. I mean, there's a guy I wrote this guy's name down because I love uh, Stephen Conrad. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, on the TV, he's the uh, per Perpetual Grace, The Patriot on Amazon. He did Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Oh, um, yeah. Have you heard of him? Oh, I love Secret Life of Walter Mitty. It's a great film. I love quirky. Um, just different. Fair enough. Now, where can people uh, find you and your work? <laughs> As if they want to after this. <laughs> <laughs> If anyone's still listening, I don't, want, I don't know. Go, go to um, uh, moviemarketingmakeover.com. Uh, that's how you can get this free course. You could find me there. I mean, I don't know. You could find. Uh, oh, I have a company, by the way. I've only had it for like 25 years, but mm -hmm. I have a production company called Content Media Group uh, here in Los Angeles. So you could find me there too. Uh, I love, you know. Opening an ear to the, the the up and coming generation of filmmakers, so feel free to reach out with any questions. Well, we're all here to support each other and to keep indie filmmaking alive into the future. Amen, sure. brother. Preach, sir. Preach, preach. <laughs> yes, hallelujah. <laughs> amen, sir. Amen, amen. <laughs> Woo! Pass the plate, Jeff. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show, man. I I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thank you for being so honest and raw about uh, your experience. Thank you for allowing me to. Uh, beat it up a little bit for the the scope of education of our audience. I do truly appreciate it because I think we do learn much 
more from our mistakes than we do from our, our victories, as I have put my mistakes out there in many, many ways, <laughs> many times in my books and everywhere else. Um, but I think it's really great of you. So thank you again for everything you've uh, done, and good luck to you with uh, Launch 2.0. And thank you for keeping us all awake to the possibilities of what we can uh, become as indie filmmakers, Alex. Thank you for building this great community.